Welcome. Thank you for inviting me for your, into your home or office for our Sunday morning message from Park Street Christian Church here in El Dorado Springs, Missouri. On the 20th of November, the week of Thanksgiving, we're kicking off this week with Sermon 5 out of 5 in our current section 9 of Counter of Real Life Theology with Section 9 is entitled Countercultural Living. We've talked about the believer's view of life and a number of different things. Um, and today we conclude this section, Countercultural Living, with Message 5 How Should We View Materialism? We've also looked at marriage and um, the role of male and females in the church, in the world, in the home. And um, we've studied together about race and ethnicity in the prior messages in this section on countercultural living. This is the fifth and final message, again entitled, How Should We View Materialism? We're going to be looking at just a number of scripture verses selected from both the Old and New Testament. But as we start this morning, I would encourage you to have a sheet of paper out in front of you and something to write with and your Bible as well, and I'll give you several references that you can write down, then later go back and review them on your own. But let's begin with prayer. Father, I thank you for being so generous to us and for our benevolent Savior, Jesus. And I pray that you'll speak through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit through this frail vessel to the point where you are the one who gets the glory and the adoration and the praise, not me. And that I can do the best job I can in communicating truth revealed from your word about how we view materialism. This ought to be a, a message of keen interest to every believer. So I pray that you'll eliminate every distraction in the lives of those who are seen and hearing this. And I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. So today, uh, we're going to start out with an account that happened in history a number of years ago, about 500 years ago in Germany. There lived an archbishop named Albert. Now, a regular bishop in the main is the main church leader in a particular town or city, that is a bishop. An archbishop is usually the main church leader over a really important city, large city, or an entire region, and over the rest of the bishops in that region. In other words, an archbishop has a very important spiritual responsibility. So you would think that to become an archbishop would take many years of spiritual achievement, but not for Albert because it was rather easy for him. He was a member of a very wealthy German family. And thanks to his family ties, he had become an archbishop, not a bishop, an archbishop by age 23. In fact, by the time he was 23, he was archbishop of two archbishoprics which was technically against church law, but he was overseeing the bishops in uh, more than one archbishop area, right? what they called archbishoprics. But Albert had paid a little extra money to get things smoothed over as he was now overseeing bishops in two separate uh, segments of the church. Being archbishop of two archbishoprics was nice, but Albert knew there was another archbishopric archbishopric in Germany it was almost the most important of all. It was in a place called Mainz, and Albert really wanted to be archbishop of Mainz too, and become archbishop of three different places. But he didn't have, despite the family wealth, didn't have the funds for that kind of endeavor to get this third archbishop. So one day, Archbishop Albert was talking to Pope Leo, and the Pope told him that Albert could, in fact, borrow the money, find a lender, borrow the money, pay the church, become the Archbishop of Mainz, and then pay the lender back. Now, why in the world would Pope Leo be willing to let Albert buy a, an archbishopric? Well, because Pope Leo really needed the money. He was out of funds himself because when he had become Pope, the papacy had tons of money, a huge surplus in their treasury. But just two years into his reign, it was gone. He was a big spender. He lived in luxury. 
and he had spearheaded a number of large building projects and now the money was gone and it was a terrible timing because Pope Leo really wanted to finish building this magnificent basilica, basilica the cathedral uh, in Rome called St. Peter's Basilica. And you can go to Rome today and pay about $30 and take a tour of St. Peter's Basilica. It's an amazing product of the artistic genius of artists such as Raphael and Bernini and Michelangelo. So if Archbishop Albert went ahead and bought his third archbishopric, Pope Leo would have money flowing again into the, the papacy coffers and then he could continue his building project. But there was a problem. If Albert went ahead and borrowed all that money, where would he get the money to repay his lenders? And this is where the Pope had a brilliant idea. He recommended that Albert sell indulgences and use the money to pay his lenders back. Now, what is an indulgence? If you didn't come from a Catholic background, you probably don't know. But an indulgence is a document which, if you buy it for yourself, it'll mean that you can shorten some time in purgatory. Now, purgatory is, in Catholic doctrine, their belief that when you die, you don't go to heaven or to hell, but you go to purgatory so that you can be purged of any unconfessed sins, previously unconfessed sins. And... Uh, by buy, buying indulgences, it was like a license to indulge in a little bit more sin and be able to shorten your time in purgatory for any sins that you failed to confess and have dealt with and forgiven by the bishop, the church. And so, um, if you bought these documents, these indulgences for dead relatives, your indulgences were special because uh, you could let them, um, you could help them get out of purgatory even though they were, you know, not alive. You could shorten their time in purgatory. So often what a uh, friar or bishop would do would claim to have a piece of the actual cross that Jesus died on and for X amount of money you could purchase this, this indulgence and um, that was their fundraising tactics for building cathedrals and all those kind of things. So, but these particular indulgences were of special value. Previous indulgences only forgave you of incomplete penance, that is, an action of repentance, which a priest assigned after he had pronounced your sin forgiven by God. That wasn't enough to have your sin forgiven by God in their doctrine. You still had to do some penance for your salvation. And so these indulgences completely wiped all sin away. These indulgences were said to actually forgive your sins, something that only before that time Jesus was able to do. They said that uh, they were said to be so powerful, these indulgences, that they could actually make you cleaner than Adam was before the fall into sin. So Archbishop Albert borrowed the money, paid for his third archbishopric, and began selling indulgences in order to be able to pay back his lender, the man he was indebted to. Church authorities started selling these indulgences in a German city called Wittenberg. Now some of you are probably already ahead of me. In Wittenberg lived a professor who was studying for the priesthood. He saw what was going on and he really got angry. Here were all these poor people in Wittenberg buying these pieces of paper they couldn't afford. Also that an archbishop could have more than one archbishopric that he shouldn't have had at all. So all the, so the Pope could have one more cathedral that he didn't need. The professor decided to write a list of reasons why this was wrong a number of issues that he had with Catholic doctrine, the doctrine of the church. And he took his list and nailed it to the church bo uh, building door. This list of 95, re 95 reasons was called the 95 Thesis. And the professor's name, of course, was Martin Luther. And that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, of reforming, bringing reform to the church. 
<clears throat> here's a lesson we must remember when it comes to Christians and money for today in 2022. <clears throat> it's a lesson the church must never forget. When money is too important, you cut corners when it comes to Christianity. When money is too important, you cut corners when it comes to your relationship to Jesus Christ. How could a 23-year-old become an archbishop? Money. How could a 23-year-old become archbishop of two archbishoprics? Money. Then archbishopric of three, you know, money. Why did the church sell documents and say those pieces of paper could forgive your sins? Money. And again, you can visit St. Peter's Basilica today. It's a magnificent structure. And when you look at that 440 foot high dome and inside that 20,000 person capacity building at that 100,000 square feet of mosaic on the roof, the ceiling, Ask yourself, was the cost worth it? Was the cost worth it? When Christians care about money above anything else, they cut corners. And when people see that, when lost people see that, they conclude all the Christians care about is money. And I think they must be frauds, they conclude. And many of them will come to even an even darker conclusion, conclusion of their God must be a fraud as well. So this need for Christians to be intentional about their relationship with money doesn't just apply to churches in general, broadly. People are watching you individually and your household, and if you're all about money, you too will cut corners when it comes to your faith. People will notice and cause the cause of Christ will be hindered because of the bad testimony from your life. The Apostle Paul writes to his young understudy Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 and 10. 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 and 10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money will have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now what would cause Paul to write this? Well, Timothy was a young church leader, but a leader nonetheless in the church where he was located at. And he was helping to disciple other believers, especially focused on training potential elders and deacons. And so, how high on your value system is money? How high on your value system is money? Some people put money higher than their health. They work too many hours for them to be able to really take care of themselves properly. They get too little sleep and have too much stress. And eventually, any extra they've made ends up going to take care of their health to doctors and such. Some people put money higher on their own than their own integrity at work or on their tax forms. And trading away your integrity is bound to cause buyer's remorse. And once you trade away your integrity, it's hard to get it back. Some people put money higher than their families. And so kids grow up with a parent who provides for them materially, but not a parent who connects with these children. And the rest of their lives, those, those kids are poor emotionally as a result, maybe spiritually poor. Some people put money higher than the people who really need it, people around them. They know about people's needs, the orphans who need to be sponsored, the missionaries who need to be sent. But for them, money is a higher value than lost people. A saying that every family ought to get used to saying, believing, and reminding each other of is people are more important than things. People are more important than things. Kids, kids need to hear that, but so do their parents. So do adults. Some people put money higher than God's purpose for their lives. And they know that God wants them to live out a particular purpose. He's gifted them to do that. He's called them to that. But rather than, they'd rather take a different path because of the, the money. Well, it's going to be pretty hard to explain that to God on Judgment Day. Now, it's true. Money's important. It's necessary. And God wants you to pay your bills. And you got to provide for your family. He wants you to do that and to save for your children's college and to have an emergency fund. But in 
in your value system, what does it beat out? What does money beat out? Because when money is really important to you and when you love it, you cut corners. Now let's all admit that when we're talking about money, that's a very personal issue to deal with. None of us likes people telling us how to spend our money. However, it's also true that Christians, as Christians, God owns us. We are not our own. He paid for us with the blood of his son on the cross, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.20. 1 Corinthians 6.20 reads, You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. And since God owns us, he has the right to tell us what to do with our money and everything else. Furthermore, since he owns us, it's really not our money in the end anyway. So, let's see what God's word has to say to us about our money. So, I'm going to ask you 10 questions about you and your money. These 10 questions will get at your heart and make it clear if you answer the, these questions honestly. Whether you have changes that need to be made. Now, I think it's really appropriate for this message to pray at this point. Because we're going to be going through some tough questions and we all need to have some humility before God if any lasting changes and commitments are to be made. In fact, I think it might be helpful for you to get out your wallet or your purse or your checkbook or your phone or tablet, however you pay your bills, and hold those things in your hand or on your lap during this prayer these things that symbolize our money so would you pray with me father i thank you for blessing us with this privilege of living in this country of great abundance where we have the opportunity to choose all kinds of different careers of which we can make a very comfortable living for ourselves and we can be useful in furthering and advancing your kingdom. Would you help us today as these questions are asked? Would you speak these questions to each of our hearts in such a way that we become completely open and honest before you? We want to be the best disciples of Jesus, the best followers of Christ we can be. And so we know this is a very important issue. Speak to us. And help us to have the right priorities as a result. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now these are questions that we're asking about our possessions. Our house, our vehicles, our 401ks, our checking savings accounts, our farms, etc. The first four questions are asking about our money and our stuff. The last six questions we're going to be asking about ourselves. So here's question one. Is this mine or is it God's? Is this mine or is it God's? Does your money, car, house, farm belong to you or to God? Is it mine or is it God's? Well, Proverbs 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That's pretty plain. Is this mine or is it God's? Question two. Is this my master or is God. Is this my master or is God? Jesus himself calls money a master and says that we can't serve two masters. We can't serve both God and money. Both want to be your master. So which is it going to be? Proverbs, or Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one, love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So is this my master or is, is God? Question three. Is this my security or is God? Is this my security or is God? Proverbs 11.28 says, Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. So is this my security or is God? Question four. Is this my treasure or is my treasure eternal? Is this my treasure or is my treasure eternal? You see, God offers treasure. 
but it's treasure that endures, it's treasure that lasts, it's treasure that can't spoil, fade. It's treasure that's eternal. It won't rust, it's inflation proof. It's what Jesus calls treasures in heaven. God offers things like love, joy, peace, and if we're honest, these are the things, the kinds of treasures everybody's truly looking for. That's the real bottom line. Love, joy, and peace. Jesus said also in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 20, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. So question four, is my, this my treasure or is my treasure eternal? So these four questions you ask about your money and your possessions. Is, it, is this mine or is it God? Is it my master or is God my master? Is it my security or is God my security? Is this my treasure or is my treasure eternal? Now the rest of the questions, questions 6 through 10, are questions you need to ask yourself about you. Answer these questions and they'll tell you a lot about yourself. The point of this is to give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to tell you if there are any corners you're cu cutting in your Christianity because of money. So here's question five. Am I fulfilling my responsibilities? Am I fulfilling my responsibilities? The Bible talks about three main priorities, three main responsibilities that you have about your money. They, they are God, family, and government. God, family, and government. Regarding God, Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled with the overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new, new wine. So that's the first responsibility that you're to fulfill, your responsibility to God. And that was Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Secondly, family, and that's scripture, is 1 Timothy 5, 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially of their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 5, 8. <clears throat> the second area where you have responsibility with your money, your family. Now, <clears throat> that brings up something I need to mention. <clears throat> the Bible says there, Paul tells Timothy, that we are responsible to do everything we can to provide for our immediate family. <coughs> and I believe that includes your aging parents. Now, I know a couple, you'll probably see this, who are part of our church family, who have not been able to attend in person for a number of months because they are caring for the husband's dad and mom in their home. Now they planned years and years and years ago to do this. They built their house with this in mind, with living quarters for the husband's parents. And in recent, the last couple of years, the parents' health has failed quite a bit. COVID exasperated the issue. But they are they also utilize some in-home health care services, but they are caring for his failing elderly parents in their home, and they're able to do that and at least delay till it can't be helped, possibly, putting either of them in a nursing home. They're doing everything they can to keep from that. <clears throat> now, not everybody is able to do that, but they are able to do that in part because of their walk with the Lord and their <clears throat> planning ahead that this day was coming. Now, they would tell you <clears throat> that it's probably a bigger responsibility than they knew they were going to have in some ways that I won't go into in detail. But it's, <clears throat> it's the biblical thing for them to do. It's the biblical, biblical responsibility that they're carrying out. So, there's three phases or responsibilities we have before God with our money. One is to God directly, one is family, and then this, the third is government. Government is the third <clears throat> responsibility that we have. 
<coughs> Jesus in Luke 20, verse 25 said, then give back to Caesar what Caesar's and to God's what's God's. So we have a responsibility to give to the government what belongs to them. So that's the fifth question. Or am I fulfilling my responsibilities? Question six, am I helping the needy? Am I helping the needy? And God takes this very seriously. There are poor people who generally have trouble making ends meet. For example, the Bible often talks about widows and, and the orphans, people who have lost their breadwinner. And throughout the Bible, it's clear the church needs to be taking care of those people. In fact, that's true religion, taking care of people who need help. According to James, in James 1.27, James 1.27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Jesus in Matthew 25, verse 35. Matthew 25, verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. <coughs> I was hungry and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. So, question six, am I helping the needy? If you're God's child, then you should have family resemblance, you know? And you'll care about the people who need help and you'll help meet their needs. Question seven out of ten is, am I working hard? Am I working hard? In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, the Bible says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. Paul says, The one who's unwilling to work shall not eat. Hard work feels good. Hard work, <clears throat> it's really nice to have something when you work hard and you have something to show for it when you get done. You have and. And it means a lot to you. You feel like you've accomplished something. It's laziness that's boring and feels terrible. So we ought to work hard and enjoy our work. Plus, worship is a lifestyle. And so your work is to be an expression of your worship. Work is to be an expression of your worship of God. You're to do whatever your work is that you're gifted and talented and led to do, called to do the best you can to the glory of God. It's not just about providing a living for yourself, but it's also about honoring God by the way you do your work, the quality of your effort and work, your motives. <coughs> so are you working hard? That's question seven. Scripture with 2 Thessalonians 3.10. So we're winding down here, and that is will bring us to the next question. And that is the ninth question. Well, let's, let's do question eight first. Question eight. Am I guarding my integrity? Am I guarding my integrity? Speaking of value system, of where things rank in your value system, check out the value system in these verses. Proverbs 22, verse 1. Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Or Proverbs 28, verse 6, Better is the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. <clears throat> so are you guarding your integrity? Your integrity is way more important than riches. That's question 8. Am I guarding my integrity? Scriptures are Proverbs 22, verse 1, and Proverbs 28, verse 6. And then question number 9. Am I at peace? Am I at peace? It's important to admit that money doesn't really buy peace, even if having money helps us feel more secure for a while, for a time. In fact, the more stuff you have, the more stuff you have to worry about, to be concerned about, to manage. And money isn't even as close to as valuable as your peace, your peace of mind. And so many people are stressing themselves sick to get money when peace comes from God. Proverb or Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13. Philippians 4, 11 to 13 says, I am not saying this because I'm in need, but I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in poverty and want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, I think it's important that verse, Proverbs, uh, Philippians 4.13, gets quoted out of context a lot. God's not telling us that we can do whatever we want to do. Because he's going to give us the strength to do that. No, he gives, and he gives strength for you to do what you're designed to do. 
But the context of Philippians 4.13 is contentment. Learning to be content. God gives us the strength to do that. So that's question nine. Um, am I at peace? And then question ten. Am I grateful? Am I grateful? Everything good we have comes from God. Everything. In James 1.17, the Bible calls God the giver of every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift. So do you thank him regularly for what you have, not just the week of Thanksgiving? Do you thank him for the material blessings that you that you enjoy because he's he's given you the ability to work and to have a job and live in this country where you have choices? Are you thankful to him? Do you express that to him for the material blessings that he's enabled you to work hard for? Do you thank him for the eternal blessings that he's given you? One prayer we can pray continually is, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for giving me access to your word, for the Holy Spirit living within me, for Christian family members or grandparents or parents or whatever who have impacted you, other people in God's family who have helped point you to Jesus and expose you to God's word. Do you thank him regularly for your eternal blessings? That you'll always enjoy beyond this life and into eternity. See, when we pause and think about it, it's amazing all, what all God has given every one of us. He's forgiven us. He saved us. He provided for our needs. He surrounded us with the family of God, the church. Philippians 4.19. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. That's a lot of glory. That's a lot of riches. So let's review these questions real quickly in review and let the Holy Spirit point out to us if there are any of these that we need to bring before God and confess our disobedience in and ask for his help. Is this mine or is this God? That's question number one. Is this mine or is it God's? Is this my master or is God? Is this my master or is God? Is this my security or is God? Is this my security or is God? Is this my treasure or is my treasure eternal? Is this my treasure or is my treasure eternal? And number five, am I fulfilling my responsibilities, God, family, and government? Am I fulfilling my responsibilities of God, family, and government? Number six, am I helping the needy? Am I helping the needy? Number seven, am I working hard? Am I doing an honest day's work? Number eight, Am I guarding my integrity? Am I guarding my integrity? Number nine, am I at peace? Am I at peace? And number 10, am I grateful? Am I grateful? But let's close today by looking about the need to solve a deeper debt crisis. Solving a deeper debt crisis. You know the Bible doesn't talk about debt in a very good light. Proverbs 6, 1 to 5. Proverbs 6, chapter verses 1 to 5 reads, My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you've shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you've been trapped by what you've said, so ensnared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion. Give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter around here uh, like a deer from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Proverbs says that if you're in debt, you need to free yourself and be as committed to getting out of debt as a, a deer is committed to getting away from the hunter. And Proverbs 22 explains, Proverbs 22 explains debt really is a type of slavery. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is the lenders, is slave to the lender. The borrower is slave to the lender. So debt is an especially dirty word, but it's really, really a dirty word when it comes to a far worse kind of debt than money. This kind of debt, this is the kind of debt that no matter how hard you try or how fast you run, you cannot free yourself from it. What kind of a debt am I talking about? 
Let's let Jesus answer that in John 8, verse 34. John 8, 34, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Our indebtedness makes us makes an appearance in the book of Colossians, the second chapter, Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. Paul said, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. He canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. It was on the cross that Jesus said, it is finished. The Greek word there is tetelestai. And when you said the word tetelestai in the marketplace, it applied to, to the it is finished concept to debt. It meant paid in full. At the cross, your sin debt was completely canceled. Your sins were completely forgiven. You don't need to buy an indulgence. You just need to have a grateful heart and a willingness to trust and follow the Lord Jesus. If I can help you in any way, grow in your understanding of Christ, or maybe come to Christ and surrender to Him for the first time, please reach out to me. You can text me or call me at area code 660-342-3068. That's area code 660-342-3068. That's my cell phone number. I'll be glad to visit with you and to send to you some information, some material that might help you in that, that process of surrendering to Christ, of committing to be a follower of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is someone who knows Jesus and is being changed by Jesus and is partner in the work of Jesus. And I pray that that's you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of your word in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're willing to use frail sin prone people like myself to communicate it. And I pray you'll use it somehow through this video that'll make a difference in someone's life. And I want you to receive the glory in Jesus name. Amen.